Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. This is the fourth session of the webinar, Thriving in Substance Use Disorders, Service Delivery in the Post-COVID Era. My name is Andrea Hevler, and I will be your facilitator today. Before we start, we wanted to remind you that this session is being recorded for later distribution. You may find this session at the end of the month at the Be Well Texas YouTube channel. In front of us today, we have a questions and answer or Q&A box and a chat box. And the Q&A box, of course, is for you to drop there all your questions. And our speaker will answer those questions as she moves along through the presentation, or most likely we're going to leave them to the end of the session. But please feel free to use the Q&A box just for questions. And then the chat box is an interactive tool that we created just for this session because our presenter wanted today to make this didactic experience uh, a little bit more interactive and organic. So she is going to be asking some questions. Please add to the chat box the answers that our speakers will, our speaker, I'm sorry, will ask today. So that's it. We have two spaces that you can use as you will during this session, very easy. And just regarding our CMEs and CEs, a quick description just for some of you who might be new to our webinar. For CMEs, you will be sending the uh, text code that we are sharing during this session. That text code should be sent today before midnight. For CEs, and with that, I'm talking specifically about the certificates, for behavioral health professionals, those you should be receiving approximately three weeks after this session, assuming of course that you answer the post-session survey. So it's very easy, the process for CME and CEs, but if you have any questions, just send us an email at our email address at Be Well Texas. One of our team members will be sharing that email address with you shortly. And with that, we're going to be moving to our presentation, and we're very happy today. We have a special presenter. We have Dr. Brittany Houston. Dr. Houston, thank you for being with us today. She is a licensed psychologist and an associate professor at Dell Medical School. She is also the behavioral, the behavioral sciences director at Dell Family Medical and she's also the co-chair at the special interest groups at the Collaborative Health Association. She is someone who is going to talk to us today about COVID compassion fatigue. Very important topic that you wanted to hear about. So she's the perfect person to talk about the topic. Dr. Houston, thank you again for taking part of this webinar. Please, whenever you're ready, you can take it away with your participation. Perfect. Thank you for that introduction. I'm going to share my screen uh, so we can get going on our presentation. All right. Thumbs up. You can see my presentation okay? Perfect. Perfect. So I'm so excited to talk with you today about compassion fatigue related to COVID-19 and raise that awareness and also how to enhance provider resiliency. Um, I have no financial disclosures to make. And at the end of this presentation, I'm hoping that you'll be able to walk away with these main objectives, being able to identify psychological stressors of COVID-19 specific to healthcare workers, be able to describe different factors that impact compassion fatigue, recognize manifestations of compassion fatigue, and outline individual and organizational strategies for resilience and intervention. As we're going through the presentation, I noticed that some of you have already put your name and your role of your organization in the chat. So feel free to put your name, role, and organization. And one thing that you might want to learn from this presentation, hopefully we'll be able to answer those questions throughout our presentation today. If not, we'll have a Q&A at the end of our presentation to address some of those concerns. 
So before we get into talking about compassion fatigue, which you can think of as the absence or lessening of compassion, I think it's really important to talk about the presence of compassion and what that is. So we're going to watch a short video that explores the differences between compassion, empathy, and sympathy. Sympathy, empathy, compassion. These three words often get used synonymously, but there are some important differences. When you think of compassion in particular, what comes to mind? How is it different or similar to sympathy and empathy? It can be tricky to tell between them to begin with, but knowing what compassion really is, is crucial when researching these topics. Here at the Compassion Research Lab, we've conducted extensive research on compassion. We've looked long and hard at what it is and how it differs from sympathy and empathy. We did this by reviewing the scientific literature and by speaking with patients directly about their experiences. Both the literature we reviewed and the patients we spoke to gave us a comprehensive understanding of the true nature of compassion. To illustrate, let's imagine you're a patient recently diagnosed with cancer. Your outlook... Oops, sorry about that is good, but you're worried. On top of all of this, it's happened right in the middle of a big move. Hearing about this, you notice your family, friends, co-workers, and healthcare providers all react in different ways. Oh my goodness, that sounds awful. Are you going to be okay? I'm so sorry. It must be horrible. Thinking of you, this is sympathy. It's a pity-based response based on a lack of understanding. It makes people say things that make them feel better, but it doesn't do much for you. Then there are others that try to understand what it would be like for them if they were in your situation by trying to feel what you are feeling. They tell you that they know what you're going through. They imagine what it would be like for them to be in your shoes. They might tell you that they have gone through something similar. This is empathy. It makes you feel heard, understood, and a bit better about your situation. But then there are those who try to really understand what it is like for you to feel what you feel and who aren't afraid to suffer with you and to do something to help. They actively listen, they're kind, they're loving, and they genuinely seek to understand you and your unique needs. But then they go one step further and show up on the weekend to help out with the big move. They haven't said they feel sorry for you. They haven't just understood you. They have been selfless and done something to help. They aren't afraid to engage you in your suffering. They understand you and what you actually need, not just what they would want if they were in your shoes. Most important of all, they actually do something to improve your situation. That is compassion. Sympathy, empathy, and compassion may seem similar, but for those experiencing suffering, the differences are obvious and impactful. Patients told us that sympathy was unwelcomed and unhelpful. They told us that empathy was better because it attempted to understand what it would be like to be in another person's shoes. But compassion took things to the next level by understanding and addressing a patient's needs in a personalized manner, not just through words or feelings, but by putting their ego aside and by getting their hands dirty in order to actively engage and alleviate a person's suffering. All right, sorry, trying to go back here. So now that we watched a little video on um, exploring the differences between compassion, empathy, and sympathy, I'm wondering if in the chat, you can uh, outline the letters outlined on this presentation of what would be a sympathy response. Yes, got some A's, great, great. Thank you for the participation. A and C, perfect, perfect. Thank you, yes, so sympathy would be that A and C 
response. Okay. And then if you can put the letter or letters that would be an empathy response. Y'all are on it today. Perfect, perfect. We're getting a lot of right answers. So it'll be that B response. And then of course, go ahead and put in that chat, what would be a compassion response? Perfect. So we've got a good knowledge check here. Got lots of Ds, right? And D would be that compassion response as long as that individual follows through on how they can help, right? Helping that person in the way that they want to be helped. And so now we've gotten a good understanding logically of what compassion is. And now I wanted to take you through a small exercise to get in touch with um, what compassion can feel like. So I'm going to take you through the Reliving Compassion exercise that was created by the Resiliency Center at Dell Children's that will allow us to get in touch with some of those feelings. Um, for this tool, I'm going to turn off my camera so you can just focus on the words and whatever may arise for you. Now, for some people, accessing feelings of compassion can be very difficult or distressing. So feel free to walk away and disconnect from this tool at any time to take care of yourself. All right. So I want you to take a moment to settle into a comfortable position, maybe sitting or standing. And for this tool, I'm going to ask you to go back into your memory. So it can be helpful to close your eyes or cast your gaze downward softly. I want you to consider a recent situation where you were giving or receiving compassion. Either you noticed someone who was struggling and offered them help or kindness, or you were the recipient of some help or kindness. This situation could involve another person or even an animal. A number of situations may be coming up for you, but please just choose one. Please visualize the situation clearly. Who was there? What happened? Now please notice any feelings that are rising, what sensations are occurring in your body. Are there any places of warmth or another feeling? What does compassion feel like? Notice what compassion feels like for a few more moments.
carry this exercise from, with me. And when you're ready, open your eyes and come back to the presentation. All right, as you're coming back to the presentation, I'm wondering if you might use the chat to just put one thing, maybe even just one word you noticed while you were imagining yourself either experiencing or receiving compassion. That love for others, validated, strong, grounded to human connection, felt acceptance for who I am, joyful, felt sad for a moment, then been the warmth, peace, a sense of calm, safe. I felt relief when I felt when I did this exercise, gratefulness, being given a cozy hug. Oh, that feels so nice. Peace, wonderful safe and comforting. Yes, thank you all for putting everything in the chat. Just even these words are bringing compassion to me right now. And feel free to continue putting those words in the chat um, if you haven't answered as we, as we move on. So I'd really like to open up now that we've got an idea of compassion for cat compassion with the way it feels and understanding the difference between compassion, empathy, and sympathy. I want to open our conversation of compassion fatigue with a quote from James Baldwin from his work, The Fire Next Time, that I really feel like describes our experience as healthcare workers or anyone in the help in the helping profession. And James Baldwin says, one can give nothing whatsoever or whatever without giving oneself. That is to say, risking oneself. And I really like this quote because in, inherently in working with people who are in high needs, who are suffering, and we're giving, giving compassion to them, right? We're giving ourselves. And when we, when we give ourselves, often it's in pursuit of a value, of what, in pursuit of something that's important to us. And I like this word of risking, risk, because when we think about risking, there's a risk when you do this activity or you engage in this type of behavior that things will go well or things could go not so well. And so when we're thinking about taking that risk, I like to think about compassion fatigue as the risk and it not going so well, okay? The cost that might come from it. And compassion fatigue can be defined as a state of reduced capacity for compassion as a consequence of exhaustion caused by contact with the suffering of others. Now, this is the contact of suffering of others, but also the inability to alleviate the discomfort of the high emotional toll it can take on healthcare workers when we are seeing a lot of those traumas, a lot of that suffering. And a lot of words that are used when talking about provider well being and compassion fatigue is compassion fatigue, secondary trauma, and burnout. So we can think of compassion fatigue as work-related secondary trauma exposure. And often compassion fatigue happens rapidly after a stressful event or multiple stressful events. And it looks like almost like a preoccupation with another patient or multiple patients' traumas. Now burnout, um, I'm sorry, secondary trauma often can be used interchangeable for the definition of compassion fatigue. Now, burnout is something completely different. It is something that happens over time. So the gradual erosion of, um, of this occurs when there's a perception that the demands of the job outweigh the resources available, right? So this is the everyday kind of grind of working on a job, considering multiple factors that you have to, multiple stressors that you come into, during the job, not just the patient stories. 
And when someone is experiencing burnout, right, it, com it comes along with this idea of feeling exhausted, feeling like they can't achieve much, um, and it can go, it, it can happen gradually. So now we're talking about compassion fatigue. I'd like everyone in the chat just to put on a scale of uh, one to 10. How important it is, do you think, to talk about compassion fatigue here and in other places? One being not important, 10 being very important. All right, getting a lot of 10s. And I'm guessing that would happen because you all are here today, but just wanted to uh, survey my audience. Perfect, perfect. And so why do we talk about compassion fatigue? And so one of the reasons is, is it's not just COVID-19 related, right? Healthcare workers were designated as a high risk population for compassion fatigue way before COVID-19. And that we actually saw that healthcare workers had um, um, mild to moderate compassion fatigue in COVID-19 and that there was an increase of compassion fatigue and burnout during the COVID area. Um, not only do these uh, COVID-19 related stressors uh, put healthcare workers at risk for compassion fatigue, it also uh, impacted their well-being, causing potential lower well-being during this period. Now, the individual cost of compassion fatigue is also joined by the organizational and healthcare cost of compassion fatigue, where we can see that compassion fatigue is uh, correlated with a reduced standard of care, negative patient experience, and even a diminished workforce because people are retiring early. If we dive further into some of those stresses specific to the COVID-19 pandemic and we look how it affected the general population, you can see there was a lot of uncertainty during this time. Like, People's lives, livelihood, and their health were threatened. There was trauma exposures. People were experiencing multiple different types of losses. So loss of their health, loss of loved ones, loss of job, loss of security. And behavioral health concerns during this time actually globally increased by 25% in the instances of depression and anxiety. And so we actually can see that the mental health impact of COVID-19 was larger than the medical impact. Um, people were feeling socially isolated, they were afraid of uh, infection, and this actually caused many people to not actually engage in healthcare, right? They were staying at home for fear of infection. Now, when you think about the COVID-19, this presented a unique situation in which the healthcare workers were experiencing the same trauma alongside the people that they serve. So we call this a collective trauma. So in addition to all of the general population stressors, healthcare workers uh, experienced an additional set of stressors because often when people in the general population, they were staying at home, they were responding differently to that COVID-19 pandemic and healthcare workers were sometimes still expected to go in and and fly, kind of fly a plane while they were building it, right? They were in a chaotic environment. They weren't, they weren't sure if they were going to have enough PPE. They were experiencing physical discomfort due to the PPE. They were feeling unprepared. Um, protocols were changing left and right, trying to keep up with the current evidence. And not only was it on the job stress, but there was some stigma in the population about even interacting with healthcare workers because of fear of increased risk of infection. And so the social network, either per stigma or even the providers narrowing their social work might have taken away some social support that was there previously. Those providers experienced a secondary trauma. And then when society came together to kind of support and protect healthcare workers, they branded them as superheroes, right? Honoring their service to the population. But what do what happens when we think of superheroes? Superheroes often we think are people that don't get sick, 
that don't give up, that don't fail. And so that also added an additional pressure on these providers who were trying to serve people in the COVID-19 pandemic, along with moral injury that comes when adjusting expectations in a controlled environment. So besides the factors that we outlined previously, there are some individual factors that may um, cause people to be more at risk for developing compassion fatigue. Some of those individual factors are lack of support. So in their social network, feeling a value misalignment, either with organizations such as, you know, separating family members who were dying from COVID-19, um, or even a value misalignment with the beliefs around vaccination for COVID-19. Individuals that tend to use excessive empathy, right? Empathy, not compassion. It's of course, it's important to designate those differences as we did before. And also individuals who had a personal history of trauma or already had a psychological disorder are more inclined, were more inclined to get compassion uh, fatigue. Now, some of the organizational factors that might put someone at risk um, for compassion fatigue are those that do take care of that vulnerable population that are at risk at death, suffering, who are have high needs, who have experienced trauma themselves. Also coming into contact with a lot of challenging either family or patient interactions, staff interactions, and feeling like they don't have the training to adjust to some of those environments. So we've talked a little bit about compassion fatigue. In the chat, if you could put how confident are you, confident are you that you can spot signs of compassion fatigue on a scale of one to 10? One being not confident at all, 10 being I can see it for sure. Very confident. Very nice, 10, sevens, eight, six. Six is very nice, five, six, eight. Thank you. Yeah, so we've got people on the top or half end of compassion fatigue, and it can be really hard to do because compassion fatigue can look like so many different things. And we're going to talk about that on our next slide. So compassion fatigue can look like many different things, as I said before. So physically, it may look like your heart beating really fast, you're unable to sleep, you're tired all the time, you feel like you've got high blood pressure or your stomach's upset. Behaviorally, we may be reaching for substances or chemicals to help us cope with this type of concern. We might be making medication errors or um, have tardiness showing up to work, or even when we do show up to work, not being there completely and fully. We might be just trying to get through the day um, and get home, so spending less time with our patients. Psychologically, emotionally, this might look like apathy, numbing, depression, anxiety, feeling like your fuse is a lot shorter than normal, feeling like no one understands what you're going through or that you're alone, um, depersonalizing patients, feeling like what no matter what you do, it doesn't matter, right? That low sense of accomplishment. And spiritually, it can look like doubting what's important to you, doubting your values, doubting your beliefs, withdrawing from fellowship, those communities, and being angry with the higher being that you connected with. So of course, not all of these are gonna be present with everyone. And so it, compassion fatigue can look very different and be expressed very differently across individuals. And so I talked about this word risk, right? When the risk in giving oneself. And we talked about the thing about it not going so well. And I want to talk about the other side as well, which is you're risking and things do go well. And that's compassion satisfaction. So compassion satisfaction is derived from helping others and alleviating suffering when it come when you come in contact with some of those traumatic events or distressing events. Often this is the reason why we do our work and it may be even some of the feelings that you felt when you were doing that first tool today, that warmth, inspiration, comfort, 
the the nice warm hug. And so uh, I wanted to at least give give credit to that side of us giving ourselves as well. The interesting thing about this is that individuals can definitely be high in both compassion fatigue and compassion satisfaction. What we see less typical is that someone is high in compassion satisfaction and high in burnout. So what can we do? What interventions can we do? So inherently in working with, uh, with high needs populations and people who are suffering or experiencing trauma, we're going to come in contact with hardship. That's not something we can take away from the work that we do and is often something why we do the work we do. And so we really have to focus on resiliency. So the ability to bounce back when you do come in contact with hard hardship and adjust for the future. And so some organizational strategies that can be put into place to inspire resilience of employees and staff is first educating and recognizing on compassion fatigue and the collective trauma. Well, what we know about multi uh, traumas in general is just because the stressors have gone away doesn't mean that the impact has gone away. And so it's important to validate that and recognize that and create psychologically safe and trauma-informed environments to be able to check in on people's psychosocial support needs regularly. As we see people kind of adjusting to this post-COVID era, um, you can see that organizations may be revisiting policies that were in place prior to um, COVID-19 and bringing those back or adjusting policies based on the current context. So providing brief and regular forums to update staff about the changing practices can be helpful, as well as providing different mechanisms for our staff and uh, employees to be able to comment on those concerns. Not everyone is gonna speak up in a meeting, right? Will people like to give feedback different ways? And so I have multiple mechanisms in order to give that feedback. Also, in order to encourage community, we want to encourage people to read out, reach out to their colleagues um, to discuss stressful situations and that peer support. Also, making employee assistance programs as easy to access as possible. I've seen many uh, EAPs that it's absolutely so hard to get into or navigate around how to access that resource. And then making uh, that psychosocial support a regular check-in. If you're checking in on someone's physical safety or their progress at work or how they're doing at, at their work, making sure that their psychosocial support is included in that check-in. And to help with some of the strenuous parts of the day, commu uh, providing communication training to navigate some of these challenging patient or family or staff interactions can be helpful. So there are a lot of uncontrollables in healthcare. And so individual interventions is really focusing on what you can control and identifying what you can't control and taking your energy away from that to move towards the things that you can. So it can be important to, again, connect with your coworkers around job stress, talk about job stress, but also the solutions that might come from your conversation reminding yourself that you're not alone no matter what your mind tells you, and being able to give yourself credit for the work that you're doing under the current um, resources available. Keeping a consistent routine and making sure you are exercising, eating healthy, being outdoors, seeking treatment if you need it, and then engaging in mindfulness and relaxation a strategy as needed. Another helpful individual, individual intervention is just making sure that you're self-monitoring, keeping, um, keeping up with how things are going for you so that if things are starting to slip, that we can, uh, we can start that intervention early. And so when we talk about self-monitoring, uh, a research a tool that's been actually widely used in research for compassion fatigue is the professional quality of life scale. And this is a 30 item scale, uh, 30 item scale that's on a six point Likert scale that will give you a composite score for both compassion fatigue, compassion satisfaction, and burnout. 
Now, an important um, thing to recognize about the professional quality of life scale is that it doesn't take into account those organizational factors. So it's really focusing on individuals and individual intervention. So I'd like to end our presentation today giving some compassion to ourselves through the Compassion with Healthy Boundaries exercise created by the Resiliency Center at Dell Children's. We know that emotions can be contagious. We can catch those difficult emotions, just like we can catch a virus. We can catch it from our family members, our friends, our patients, anyone we can come in contact. And sometimes that can feel like emotional Velcro that you can't get unstuck with. And so if you're noticing that you are experiencing some of that emotional Velcro, it's important to find something that you can do to relieve without disconnecting, without shutting off. And so that is my hope in providing you this tool to day. And so again, I'm going to turn off my camera and I'm just going to uh, take you through this tool. If you need to step away from this tool, uh, take that time to take care of yourself and come back to the presentation when, when you're feeling comfortable. Okay. So first, I want you to take a couple breaths with me. Once you to begin to think about someone in your personal or professional life who has a lot of needs, is really suffering, or who is exhausting you or frustrating you. Think of a person who you care about, but who may be in a lot of pain. Please clearly imagine this person and the situation they are in. Maybe you can feel a response in your body, tension, aversion, anxiety. Now listen to the following words. Everyone is on their own life journey. I am not the cause of this person's suffering, nor is it entirely within my power to make it go away, even if I wish I could. Moments like this are difficult to bear, yet I may still try to help if I can. Notice the sensations and emotions you're experiencing and begin to breathe deeply. Start to focus on the inhalation, breathing in now. Imagine you could fill your whole body with compassion as you breathe in. You might think back to what compassion felt like in your body during the first tool we did today. Feel the support of giving yourself compassion. Now, as you exhale, imagine blowing compassion in the direction of the person who is suffering and may be causing you pain. 
Again, if you need to settle yourself, please feel free to let go of this tool at any time. Continue to breathe compassion in for yourself and out for the other person, allowing your body to breathe naturally. As you do this, you might say, one for me, one for you. Or you might say, in for me, out for you. If you need a little extra compassion today, you could try 10 for me, one for you. And if it's hard to send compassion to the other person, take a moment to focus just on yourself, filling your own cup with compassion first, and then offering some to the other person. As you breathe, imagine being gently rocked by the movement of the waves in an ocean. This ocean of compassion is limitless and can hold all suffering including your own. Check your body out for any areas of tightness or discomfort and imagine sending compassion towards those places as you inhale and sending compassion out as you exhale to the other person if that still feels okay to you. Again. Everyone is on their own life journey. I am not the cause of this person's suffering nor is it entirely within my power to make it go away, even if I wish I could. Moments like this are difficult to bear, yet I may still try to help if I can. Notice the effects of this tool on the body and the mind. Now let go and allow yourself to just be as you are for a few moments. Okay, come back to the presentation when you're ready. Thank you all for doing this ending exercise with me today. Hope that you were able to receive compassion. I'd just like to end our didactic part of our session with some just quick summary points. Awareness of the continued impact of COVID-19 and healthcare workers specific trauma is important to talk about to bring awareness to. Understanding that compassion fatigue can show up differently for so many different people and that individual interventions are not enough to address compassion fatigue and inspire resilience. Thank you so much for your um, participation and I will turn it over for our Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Houston, what a great experience. This was not just a presentation, just was a full sensory experience for all of us. So interesting to realize that when you hear compassion fatigue, you think that it, you often just try to relate it to COVID-19 or healthcare, but that there is compassion fatigue that can happen in the context of 
family relationships, uh, co-workers, in our everyday relationships. So it has been an eye-opener for me, and I'm sure that the same for many of our participants. So I'm really, really happy that we have the opportunity to share this information with you. And I'm, no, it has been great, really. I, I, I've been following the exercises and it's great. So to our learners, to our participants, <clears throat> I would like to invite you right now to add into our Q&A box any questions that you may have about compassion fatigue for Dr. Houston. or also ideas or comments on our chat box as well. Yes, I see some questions coming through the chat box. We've got, what can a manager do for their employees if they suspect that they are experiencing compassion fatigue? That's a great, great question. question. Yeah, yeah. So I think that if we can lay the groundwork of what compassion fatigue is, and if you're having regular check-ins <laughs> on someone's psychosocial needs, on how they're doing, then that is a less stigmatizing conversation that can be brought up in one-on-ones and 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 um, just identifying what you're noticing and and just checking out, okay, are they noticing this, right? Often in healthcare, we're just go, go, go. So sometimes we don't even notice those things. And so I would just encourage managers to create a culture that this is something that's regularly talked about and bring it up one-on-one -on -one, uh, se as sensitively as possible. Great. Also, I have here, are there any best practices for yourself if you feel like you might be experiencing compassion fatigue? Yeah, um, so uh, those two exercises I went over today, very helpful. Um, the Dell Children's Resiliency Center has been studying that consistently, not only with their residents, but with um you know, all nurses, uh, physicians, you name it, so across healthcare. And so um, there's evidence behind it. It's, it's very helpful. Um, just even, you know, monitoring yourself and doing some of those individual interventions um, that were suggested on there, making sure you are consistent routine, eating well, um, sleeping well, often when we get so stressed out, that's the first thing to go is just our normal basic needs. Um, and compassion fatigue can definitely kind of transition into, you know, PTSD or other DSM-5 diagnosed criteria. And so at any point in time, if you're wondering, seek help. Um, because even seeking help before that happens can be can be very beneficial and seek evidence-based help like cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance commitment therapy, prolonged exposure, cognitive um, processing therapy. Right. Um, there's so many uh, helpful evidence-based strategies that can can help with with different diagnoses and different experiences. Yes, and I'm glad that you mentioned that specifically about PTSD, because oftentimes I feel like it's confused. Like sometimes we think about post-traumatic stress, stress disorder as compassion fatigue, which kind of overlap in a way, right? Yeah, yeah. And so th definitely they can be present at the same time. Um, you, there's specific uh, diagnostic criteria for PTSD. And so it would be uh, more severe and severely impacting someone's functioning, right? Um, um, but at the same time, don't wait till you are absolutely sure um, that you have PTSD. When you start feeling it, go, go early. Thank you. Also, I wanted to ask, what role do you think that cultural differences play in compassion fatigue? Because I'm sure that in different countries or in different er geographical areas in the world during COVID-19 and after, uh, different countries or cultures handle it a little different, right? Yeah. And so we have to think about just anything is uh, grounded in the context of the culture that you're currently working. May it be in the culture of your country, of your organization, of your individual culture. 
Right. Um, we talked about COVID-19 specific stressors today, but we do know that that disproportionately um, affected a different uh, minoritized populations to a greater effect. And you also have to think about um, uh, other just discriminatory practices or other discriminatory stressors that come along on top of that. Um, and so that can all impact the way that people are experiencing trauma or dealing with trauma at that time. Yes, and I have here someone says, you mentioned a phrase moral injury during your presentation. Can you describe a little bit more what this is and why it is harmful? Yeah, so I'll do my best. Um, so <laughs> when you think about moral injury, right, you think about that was uh, something we talked about this values misalignment. So um, being in a situation that doesn't fit with what you think is right and having to go along with it. Um, there were many instances, uh, for example, you know, it was painful for, uh, I know a lot of my coworkers to see families unable to see their loved ones when they were diagnosed with COVID-19 and that strong value of, of being there for their family. And they had to follow protocol to reduce um, risk of exposure. But that doesn't mean just because you follow protocol that that, that doesn't result in a moral injury. That's so true. You're following protocols, but you're still, that person feels heard or, or misunderstood the same way, of course. Great question. Yes. And that could so, be a whole talk, a whole nother. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And all the cultural aspect of compassion fatigue, absolutely. It could be a whole, uh, but this has been such a, such a great information to be shared with all of us. Um, so um, I think in the interest of time, we're going to be moving to some announcements before we close the session, but I wouldn't want to leave or do anything else today before thanking you again for this great presentation. So um, just for uh, our participants, I wanted to remind them, that, remind them that for CME credits, they are going to be texting the code that you see on the screen that is attend 100 95687 to that phone number. And you should text that code today before midnight. That is for CMEs. And for Cs, please be on the lookout for that email that we're sending you. Please answer the post-session survey. And after that, remember, we should give it somewhere between two or three weeks for you to receive your behavioral health certificate via email. So again, it's very easy, but send us an email at Be Well Texas if you're having or if you're encountering any issues. Next. And remember that the Center for Substance Use Training and Telemetry in CSTAT offers technical assistance. And technical assistance means that there is clinical mentorship or support in any difficult or challenging case that you or your team might be encountering. We will link you to additional resources or to other organizations that might help you in different scenarios at your health organization. We will support you in everything related to MOUD, MOD, or Medication for, for Opioid Use Disorders. We have peer recovery support services. Uh, we offer technical assistance. So if you ever need anything from us besides these training sessions in themselves, please send us an email or go to the uh, website that we're showing on the screen right now. Next. And our next session for this incredible seminar, Thriving in Substance Use Disorders, Service Delivery in the Post-COVID Era. Next time, it's going to be on mitigating grief and loss post-pandemic. Very much related to today's topic, I would definitely say, please uh, register. That is Tuesday, May the 21st. Go to our website 
and register for the next session. Again, it's mitigating grief and loss during post-pandemic times. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I think that you all have the slides and my email is on the last slide if anyone else wants to reach out with questions. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Houston. We will sharing, we will be sharing this didactic material. Very important. Absolutely. So once again, thank you to all of you for being here today. Remember to process your CMEs, NCEs, and post-session surveys. And we'll see you next month in another session of this webinar series. Thank you to all of you for your participation and have a great day.